So in this chapter, we pick up on magnetic forces. Although it might seem more intuitive to talk about magnetic forces between two magnets, because of the fact that magnets always have north and south stuck together, it is quite a bit harder to study the effects of magnetic field just by looking at magnets. But fortunately, as you might know from previous courses, magnetic fields also have effects on moving charges. Because things are much more well defined in that sense, the study of magnetic fields begin with talking about such forces on these moving charges. From a previous course, you might remember something about the right hand rule where I also show you in the review videos where if you have your Q times V looking like that and then your B looking like that, then your force will act in that particular direction perpendicular to both the velocity and the magnetic field. And in this course, we just want to extend that just a little bit to make use of the cross product that we have now learned how to use properly using IJK components. We can define the magnetic forces with this cross product, and that will make sure that the force is perpendicular to both the velocity and the magnetic field as well as picking off just the perpendicular component because the cross product takes care of that for us. So that cross product makes it mathematically very similar to another way you have used cross product maybe before, which is to define torque. In any case, using IJK component, I often like to use this particular mnemonic that if you have I cross J to get K, if you go that way, you get positive. But if you end up going backwards, you get negative. Or some people use determinants or whatever, but this is my method and I'll show you how to do that in this thing. Now, however, in order for that to work, we have to define what's known as a right-handed coordinate system. This is especially important when they don't already define for us what the coordinate system is, such as in this particular question here. For a 3D coordinate system, once you put that X and Y, then you have a choice. Do you put Z coming out of the page or going into the page? That's the choice. In a right-handed corner system where we can make use of cross product like this, what we have to do is we have to make sure when we take I cross J, we actually do get K. It seems a bit circular, but the right-hand corner system makes sure that I cross J equals the K so that we can make use of this mnemonic and everything makes sense. And for that to happen, if you take out your right hand, whatever convention you prefer for the right hand rule, you should get that the Z should be coming out of the page. If you have to find Z the wrong way, then you're going to get the negative answer and everything falls apart. So for this particular question, they don't give us X, Y, and Z, but it's probably useful for us to do that. And they talk about East, West, North, and some downwards. So clearly it's a 3D problem. So let's define a right-handed coordinate system in which that would work. If we look at it from above, we can say north and east looks like that. We can call that x, call that y, and then in order for north south to look like that, z must be up. Given that definition then, we can define all the vectors that we have in terms of ijk components so that we can take the cross product. So first, we have the velocity, which is, oh, they don't give us the actual magnitude yet. We'll work that out later. But we know that it goes from west to east. So it looks like that. That's your V, so it must be positive I. And then we have B. So they say there's a component to the north. North is positive Y, so J. And then a downwards component, so that's negative Z or negative K. Everything's in Tesla. So now we have all the vectors defined. Let's actually do the question. The first part is very qualitative in essence. They want us to find the path of the electron. So any charged particle in a uniform magnetic field, basically you have two choices. You have in the simplest case that the charged particle moves in a circle, a flat circle, and that would happen if the velocity is in fact perpendicular B. Or failing that, it will move in a helix. So not perpendicular to your B because there will be a component of the V that is parallel to B. So 
while it spins around in a circle, it still moves sideways to give you this kind of helix motion. And it helixes around your magnetic field. Let's see in this case which case is true. You see that the velocity only has an I component, and there is a J component and a K component for the magnetic field. And so you can almost just say by inspection that it looks like it's perpendicular. But to more formally prove it, and for more complicated looking cases, just take the dot product. If you take the dot product, two perpendicular vector, they will have a dot product of zero. So if you go V dot B, this one is obviously quite simple because I dot I, there's nothing left, J dot J nothing, K dot K nothing. So you get you do get zero. So you know that they are in fact perpendicular. So you can say that it moves in the circle. And that's probably all we want you to answer because otherwise the words get too difficult to describe. You could say that it goes clockwise or counterclockwise around the magnetic field looking onwards in the direction of the magnetic field or something like that. But as long as you identify if it's a circle or helix, I'm quite happy already. Then the next thing is knowing that it's a circle, what is the radius of curvature for the path? The radius of curvature of course depends on your uniform circular motion. So in this case, the only significant force that's acting on our particle is the magnetic force. And that magnetic force will always necessarily point towards the center of the circle, which is going to give us my centripetal acceleration times m. We're just taking the magnitude of the force here because we know the direction works itself out. So in order to get the magnitude of the force, we need the full vector of the force from the cross product because that's the definition of my magnetic force. But before we can even get there, we need to find out this size of the velocity first. There, we're actually given that my kinetic energy is 10 kilo electron volts. And of course, we can convert that into some number of joules times my elementary charge, which of course cancels out with the coulombs for the joules per coulomb my voltage. And we get some number which is fairly easy because this is just powers of 10 here, some number of joules. Then through the 1 half mv square, we know that my magnitude of velocity is 2 times ke over m all square root. Punch in the calculator, you get some number. My b is still up here. And so to take the cross product, we once again make use of my mnemonic, and then we'll find out what everything is. One key thing here though is if you think about this charge, this charge is actually negative because it's an electron. So that's going to modify our force to point the right way after we take the cross product. But really I'm just going to do it all at once. We have V cross B, so let's do it one step at a time. So first we have I cross J, which is from I to K, that's in the positive direction. And then we multiply by this negative to give us a negative k component. Using your calculator, you get some number of newtons. The units will work out as long as you are using coulombs, meters per second, and tesla. That's basically the definition of a tesla. Because it's in the k hat, I put it in the back there. I prefer to go in the back. And then we have i cross k. So then from i to k, that's a negative. But then one of these numbers is negative, so that's positive. And then the charge is negative, so we still end up with a negative in the j hat direction. That's my force. And just to double check that we haven't carelessly made a small mistake, because cross product can get a little complicated, we can redraw to make sure that everything is going in the right direction as we expect. So let's say x is pointing outwards, which is the same direction as my v. Let's say that's positive y, and by necessity, positive z must point upwards. Looking at it like that, we know that we have a magnetic field that points in the positive j and negative z. So there's my b. And so my force, using the right hand rule, remembering that we have a negative charge, so you have to point qv to be into the page. And then we end up with a force that looks like that, which is in fact negative y, negative k, check. So just a quick double check because there's a lot of calculation going on here. So now that we have the actual vector, getting the magnitude is quite trivial. And so we know that this number is equal to mv squared over r, 
and to get R then we get MV square over FB subbing all numbers we know of course this is the mass of the electron which is that it's just number plugging at this point so I'll let you do that yourselves you should get that as a result roughly speaking it's 6.3 meters as the radius of the curvature because moving charged particles tend to move in a circular path in a uniform magnetic field the ideas of uniform circular motion often comes back and so we'll make use of that in a few of the other questions as well.